That was one of the most moving accounts that I've heard. It touched my heart because I know what you went through. And this above all, I want to say, that while many of us as men have suffered terribly at the hands of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society and its minions, in most cases our sisters have suffered much more. And the chauvinism that exists in that organization is one of the most destructive things that there could be. And there is no recognition of the place of the scripture that there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male and female. The Greek says male and female, not male or female. And our sisters have suffered so terribly and have been treated as a hank of hair and a bag of bones. <laughs> It was so interesting for us to come and spend a day with Brother Bill. And he, who was disfellowshipped back in the early 1950s and had been raised as a Bible student and a witness, indicated to me that he heard Judge Rutherford use that very phrase, a quotation from Rudyard Kipling, you probably know the poem, a woman is just a woman, but a good cigar is a smoke. That's where he got this from. And it's a horrible thing, because, you know, our sisters, our wives, our daughters, our mothers are so infinitely precious to us and should be precious to us as men. I've always appreciated Martin Luther's approach to marriage. Luther, in writing letters, always referred to his wife as his rib. And of course, this is a reference to Eve being taken from Adam. But it's more than that. The rib is not part of the foot to be walked on. It's not part of the head to rule. It's that which is closest to the heart. Yes. And this is something to be remembered. And I would counsel all of you in the marriage state, or those of you who aren't married, but look forward to it at some time, to remember this. You men, and you sisters as well, remember that we men maybe are not supposed to cry, but we do. We do. And we have tender feelings too. And remember our Lord. The most tender of all was a man. We're compliments. We're not antagonists. And this is something that the Watchtower has forgotten. Women were to be used to go out preaching. That was all there was to it. But I want to talk to you about this matter of disfellowshipping. I think Apart from all of the sins that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society has committed, and I don't want to disregard other things such as the blood transfusion matter, or the matter of driving people into the day-to-day -day witness work, or the dragooning people to meetings, or the forcing of small children to sit in meetings, for hours on end. All of those things I think were disgusting, terrible, matters of work righteousness. But none of these hold a candle to the matter of disfellowshipment, disassociation, and shunning. And whether they like to use the word shunning or not, that's what it is. They do not control the English language. Praise God. The fact is that this did not exist in the early Bible student movement. 
Pastor Russell, for all of his faults, and he had many, was a man who in large measure drew from the theology common to Protestantism in his day. Many of the things which we tend to be amused at were things that were very common, not only in the sectarian movements of the day, such as Adventism, but within Lutheranism, Anglicanism, Presbyterianism. And uh, they came out of that milieu. He was a man of the 19th century, and many of the ideas which seem peculiar to us uh, were common ideas in that day. He was, after all, at the prophetic conferences in uh, the late 19th century in the United States, which have had such an impact on fundamentalism in the United States, and he was positive towards them in a way that his associate Nelson Barber wasn't. And despite the fact that there were times when he did things that were very wrong, he was arrogant towards his wife, although the problem there seems to have been that they lived together for many years without consummating their marriage. I've studied the matter in some depth. I do not believe the accusations of the man that claimed he was an adulterer. I don't think he had much interest in sex. And uh, I think that one of the great reasons for problems between them was that they didn't have a normal, healthy, sexual relationship. And she was a very powerful woman too, believed much the same sorts of things that he did. And if you read her writing, she was a bit of a feminist in her day. Uh, but he never came to a point where he believed that there should be anything like a judicial committee in a congregation. He didn't disfellowship people from the organization. Oh, during the period of time when there was the New Covenant schism, he said some very severe things. And there were times when he stretched the truth way out of shape. But he said specifically, in one occasion, that, to, that the elders should never set themselves up as a body to judge other Christians. To do so would be going back to the practices of the Middle Ages. If Pastor Russell were alive today, he would roll over in terror at what the modern-day Watchtower Society has done. And no less a person than William Snell, in his book, Twenty Years of Watchtower Slave, brings this out. And he talks about the Bible student congregation in Berlin during the period of the First World War and shortly thereafter. It was a loving organization, according to what Schnell says. And although there were plenty of things wrong with the old Bible students, in general, they were loving people. They didn't practice shunning and disfellowshipment. And despite some very strange and misguided ideas and misapplication of the scriptures, uh, and false prophecies, it has to be said, in no uncertain words. Despite all of that, there was none of the hateful judgmentalism in the, in the early Watchtower movement. Russell believed that the vast majority of mankind was going to be saved. He believed that most Christians in the churches were going to be saved. It's very interesting to note that Pastor Russell, uh, that's what he was called. I, I don't particularly like to refer to him as Pastor Russell, but that's what he was called. Prayed to Christ, unlike later Jehovah's Witnesses and Bible students. Where then did this terrible spirit of judgmentalness come in? It came in particularly in the period 1917-1918 with one judge, Joseph Franklin Rutherford, the judge for four days, who is 
historically speaking, a purely evil individual. I have done a great deal of research on him, as has Brother Person here who is with us. And uh, we have looked at Rutherford, we have looked at the Pooch, or Coup d'etat, Golpe de Estado, they call it in Spanish, that was carried out by Rutherford in uh, 1917 to dismiss the four members of the board of directors. Lies were started. Many of you know that uh, Watchtower literature to this very day, in their latest historical work, claims specifically that these men were driven out of Bethel because they rejected the finished mystery. The book that was printed under Rutherford's auspices was claimed to be the seventh volume of Russell's posthumous work. Well, if you read the finished mystery, and sometime I suggest that some of you pick up the finished mystery and read a bit of it, it makes Alice in Wonderland and looking through the looking glass very staid, sensible works. It is so utterly crazy that you wonder how any of the individuals or the two individuals who wrote this could have written such utter drivel. <laughs> it's just amazing to read this stuff. And, uh, you know, I can't understand why the Canadian and American authorities got so terribly upset about it, because it's so crazy that uh, I don't know how they could have taken it seriously and sent Rutherford and his colleagues to jail for the uh, finished mystery. Of course, it was more than the finished mystery. But such a strange work, utterly weird. And then you begin to look at Rutherford's works. In the early 1920s, of course, the millions now living will never die book. And The Way to Paradise, Van Amberg. And you look at these books and you read them now, and one of the things that comes out over and over again is the false prophecies. Another aspect that comes out of these books is the vile the viciousness, the hatred, the rancor. These books are just absolutely filled with rancor and hatred. The hatred of the churches, the hatred of the United States, the hatred of the British Empire. Oh my, oh my, Rutherford didn't like Great Britain at all. It was part of the seventh head of the beast, or the eighth head rather. It was about to be destroyed because it was the most wicked empire on earth. The only thing that was good about it was that he could come over here and booze without any problem while there was prohibition in the United States. Brother Simmons told me of a, an old Bethel worker here in the British Bethel who heard Rutherford come home one night wandering down the hall, stretching out his arms to keep from falling down, holding the walls in the aisle. And Brother Henry, the branch overseer, apparently was very annoyed at him and that there were words that were spoken and exchanged. Uh, a brother in uh, New York had a picture, unfortunately lost now, of Rutherford visiting uh, Italy drunk lying out on wine casks in a, an Italian wine cellar. But these were not the things that were the worst about this man. His drunkenness was so not notorious. I traced this down. I went to the drugstore in San Diego, California, where he and the witnesses used to buy alcohol for Beth Serum, and they had veritable trucks of alcohol trucked out. And uh, I talked to an old brother that uh, Dwayne knew quite well in Northern California, 
man by the pro name of Prosser, who had been in Canada and knew my parents very well. I talked to him. He said in 1927, when this man gave a talk at Toronto, one of the trumpets was being blown. He said, we thought he was, we, he was so drunk that we didn't think we could get him to the lectern. And he said, we got him up there and turned him loose. And he said, it was as though the man had never had a sip of alcohol. He just started speaking. This was the type of individual he was. I don't know if any of you have ever heard the records of this man's speech. He had this Missouri accent, uh, middle or border state American accent, and uh, his voice was just filled with this sense of anger. I, I remember so vividly as a boy hearing him give the talk, religion is a snare and a racket, and he started out, religion is a snare and a racket, or actually what he said was, it has often been said that religion is a snare and a racket. And then he ended up by saying, religion is a snare and a racket. And the hatred that came forth from the man's mouth was almost unbelievable. Well, how did this affect many? Well, in 1925, there were over 90,000 persons celebrating the memorial of the Lord's Supper. By 1928, there were just over 17,000 at the memorial of the Lord's Supper. And many more left. My family didn't leave. My great-grandfather had become a Bible student about 1900. My wife's uh, grandma, uh, great grandmother, it would be, uh, was associated with Pastor Russell in the 1880s. We had a long tradition within that organization. My grandmother was baptized in 1908. We went through the persecution in Canada of two world wars. In the First World War, all Watchtower literature was banned. In the Second World War, it was illegal to be a Jehovah's Witness, and if you had a King James Version of the Bible without comments published by the Watchtower Society, you could be sent to prison. This at the behest of the Catholic Church. The flag salute issue was burning at the time, and I was a boy in school, and I suffered for this. The police came to my parents' home in the Second World War, to my grandparents' home in the First World War. We underwent a great deal of persecution as Jehovah's Witnesses. This was one of the things, I think the major thing, which kept me associated with the organization for as long as I did associate. But there was something else about our experience that was different. I never had the fear of displeasing the organization in the way that many, that most of you, who are younger than I am, did. Why? Because I grew up in a family that was always willing to question certain things that the Watchtower taught. I remember as a small boy hearing my grandmother read about some of Rutherford's false prophecies. And I said to her, Oh, Graham, that couldn't be true. And she said, yes, Jimmy, it was. Before she died as an old woman, she was about 87, she told my wife, you know, I think it's utter foolishness to teach that the saints were resurrected in 1918. And when Rutherford came out with his doctrine, that Adam wouldn't have a resurrection. I remember her telling very openly, well, I don't know whether Adam will have a resurrection or not. I leave that to Jehovah. But I'll tell you this, if he does have a resurrection, I want to be there to welcome him. You see, there was this openness. And although I considered myself a loyal Jehovah's Witness, 
There was never a time in my life that I was afraid to question. And the reason for this was that I was taught by a family that felt that you turn to the scriptures and you examine everything in harmony with the scriptures and if the watchtower taught something that wasn't in the scriptures, you ignored the watchtower. That was very rare. But that came from that older tradition, you see, that Schnell speaks about. And I grew up with that. And I heard many of the tales of what had happened in the past. And consequently, when I got to be a young man, I wasn't afraid to go on to university. When I did, it was so many years ago now, that I shocked them so much that they didn't know what to say and they didn't bother me particularly. <laughs> Later on, they began to bedevil me when I became a university professor and they persecuted our older son terribly and our nephew for going to university. In fact, our nephew dropped out because of them. And uh, they went through pain that I didn't go through. I remember too in 1966 when the uh, Freedom of the Sons of God book, I believe it was, came out and with the chart in there about 1975. We didn't go for some reason. We were ill, didn't go to a district assembly and my mother-in-law came home with the book and was telling us all about 1975. The end was coming in 1975. And I said, this is ridiculous, this can't be. Really, they didn't say that, surely. And uh, she said, yes, they did. Here's the book. You go in and take a look at it. Well, I went in and I looked at this chart, and I was in our bedroom, and I took the thing up like this, and I threw it on the bed, and I said out loud, the damn fools, will they never learn? You know, I knew all about 1925, what had happened in 1925. And why then did we stay with the organization? Well. I think we would have left shortly thereafter, but uh, then came the early 1970s. I went on a sabbatical leave to Spain. The new elder system came into existence, and there was a tremendous emphasis on conscience. And of course, I didn't know it at the time, but this was largely the work of Raymond Franz. And for a few brief years there, in the early 1970s, they defanged the circuit overseers, uh, we had the responsibility of pastoral care, shepherding, going out, treating people differently. And it was for a very brief time, I called it the Prague Spring. Remember, it was like Dubček in Czechoslovakia and then the Soviet tanks rolled in. Well, that was the way it was. That was the way it was for a brief period of time. And during that time, I became an elder and was very enthused because I thought that there was going to be change, that there was going to be a difference. I largely ignored 1975. I didn't say anything about it because you didn't dare. You didn't dare dissent. But uh, in fact, you were not expected even to keep quiet. You were expected to say, oh, yes, that's what the society is teaching. Well, I didn't. And I was looked askance at by some of the circuit overseers. But uh, we stayed, and then things began to close down again. In this, by this time, I had written The History of Jehovah's Witnesses in Canada, The Struggle for Civil Liberties. And although there are certain things in that book that I would certainly change today, because I bought some of the accounts of the Watchtower Society or about their own history, which are quite frankly lies, most of it I would uh, defend to this very day because it was dealt with civil liberties. Then I began to receive letters from various brothers asking me if I knew about such and such. They were experiencing problems. I was open-minded enough to look into this and by 1979 I was horrified when the Watchtower Society tried to explain Acts 20-20 as a basis from going from house to house. 
because they had reversed themselves on this. They bobbed off one of the statements. Actually, I went to the Brooklyn Bethel. I was doing research on what became Apocalypse Delay, my book. And uh, I was so distraught by some of these things that I went to see two brothers there. I went to see uh, Colin Quackenbush, who filled my ears with stories of the viciousness of Nathan Knorr, he and his wife. And then I went to see Raymond Franz. I could tell that Raymond Franz was in terrible pain, but at the time he said, well, let's wait. And the message I got was, well, isn't this the truth? Isn't this Jehovah's organization? And won't Jehovah set it right? By that time, I couldn't wait. I was angry, and I had been partaking at Memorial for some years before this. And I said, well, if I am a member of that faithful and discreet slave class, I have a right to speak to these men. Ha! <laughs> Try and speak to them. The doctrine of the faithful and discreet slave is the greatest myth that was ever created. Why it makes the idea of Peter being the first pope uh, look quite historical. <laughs> In any case, I wrote a long eight-page letter, which eventually resulted in my disfellowshipment. Eighty-three people in our city leaving the witnesses, including two other elders, three other ministerial servants, a number of pioneers, a number left in Ontario, a number left in Arizona, and uh, we decided that because of their wickedness we would publicize this from one end of Canada to the other. It shocked them so much that they said, friend, they said sent Fred Franz up to Calgary to attack us publicly. And the papers came to me and said, well, are you worried about what he says, that you're going to be destroyed eternally? And my reply was, well, his batting average, as far as prophecy is concerned, is zero, so I'm not really concerned. <laughs> you see, ultimately, I was disfellowshipped, and my disfellowshipment resulted in a veritable riot, quite literally. I didn't go. I sent them a note that I wasn't going to the Inquisition. My son took it, uh, my wife and several others went as witnesses on my behalf. They put them in a separate room and then when I didn't show up, my witnesses got up and walked out. Well, they have, they brought people in from all over the place. They had gone out and solicited letters against me. I was such a terrible person. I was saying things against the society. I had questioned a variety of things. I had questioned the fact that you don't gain salvation by the preaching work, which I sure had. Uh, salvation is a matter of grace, it's not a matter of works. And uh, the result was that uh, eventually they came pouring out of the Kingdom Hall. Well, some of the uh, people who had come over to our house, uh, who were leaving with us, some of the elderly sisters said, let's go back and see what's happening. And our son went back there. Well, I hadn't known anything about this, but a brother down in Washington, Richard Rowley, known to many of you, had called the Alberta Report magazine. <laughs> I was a professor nationally known. I had been the president of the Canadian Society of Church History. And uh, this was quite a thing. The papers wanted to get in on it. Well, when the witnesses came pouring out of the Kingdom Hall, the city servant, uh, charged down the street, yelling like a banshee, uh, after this photographer. And the poor man was so frightened that he ran and hid and finally went over to the university. He was a student and went into a dark room and closed the door and locked it. And uh, my son had gone over with these others and another fellow started uh, charging out the door and my son said, uh, Leave him alone. He's on the sidewalk. He has a perfectly legal right to be here. This is something the witnesses should have understood. This one fellow uh, doubled up his fist, man about 60, 
and hit my son in the face. My son has a quick temper and was 28 years old at the time and he struck him back and the fellow ended up three days in the hospital. The witnesses tried to, to uh, uh, charge him with assault. The police investigated it and said, well, he started it. So there are no charges on either side. And from then on, the whole thing was publicized. A number of my students went to the, one of the other kingdom halls and put up a sign, free boxing lessons. <laughs> 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 well, this gets away a bit from the, the story of uh, disfellowshipping, where it came in. Well, the fact is, as it exists today, it came in with the Moyle trial. Many of you know about Olin Moyle. Olin Moyle was the society's uh, lawyer, and uh, he had fought many cases on behalf of the witnesses. There's an excellent book out in the United States now on the civil liberties cases that the witnesses fought in World War II by a man by the name of Sean Francis Peters. Excellent book, which also shows their meanness. And uh, Moyle simply wrote a personal letter to Le uh, Rutherford, left it on the mantel shelf, and said, hey, things are going on here at Bethel that shouldn't go on. There's excessive drinking. There are bad, dirty stories being told. There's favoritism. And you're responsible to see that this is cleaned up. Well, Rutherford, instead of taking counsel or reproof, turned on Moyle, had the whole uh, board of directors of both societies condemn him. Then they called him a Judas in the Watchtower magazine and uh, practically destroyed Moyle's legal business in Wisconsin where he'd returned to. And... Uh, Moyle took them to court and won and was able to collect $15,000 in court costs from the Watchtower Society in, I believe it was 1944. It's an amazing thing. If you haven't read the transcript of record of this case, I would counsel all of you to because it gives a picture of the inner workings of the Watchtower Society like nothing else does. It's an amazing work. And it shows the evil of the organization and what Rutherford was like in a way that nothing else does. Rutherford was dead at the time, of course. But immediately thereafter, at the behest of the society's lawyers, particularly Hayden Covington, they set up the present system of what they first called disfellowshipping committees. They didn't call them judicial committees, they called them disfellowshipping committees in the first place. Now, what are these committees? Well, the interesting thing is that I've done a lot of historical study. My master's degree in history was on the High Middle Ages. And naturally, I was intrigued by the Inquisition. The Judicial Committees of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society are exact replicas of the Holy Office of the Inquisition of the Middle Ages and the Spanish Inquisition of the modern period. I've done a lot of work in the Spanish Inquisition. The only difference is that the inquisitors were better trained and they kept records. Now why did this occur? Why did they set up these judicial committees which are completely in violation of biblical principles? You remember the ancient Israelites had their trials at the gate and uh, two witnesses had to be brought forward and uh, there had to be protections which were nearly as complete as uh, courts of common law. The only thing in 
British and American and Canadian history that's comparable uh, to the judicial committees is the Court of Star Chamber. And uh, why did they do this? Well, there are very obvious reasons. Number one, under the common law, and this is true in, in America as much as it is here in Britain or in Canada or in Australia, all common law jurisdictions, there are basically only two reasons uh, which will allow you to take a religious organization to court. The first of these is property. If you have a property consideration and through disfellowshipment or excommunication you lose your property, that becomes a secular matter and it can be adjudicated in the courts. The other reason is if a religious organization violates its own rules. Now the question is, how can you determine whether a religious organization has violated its own rules if everything is in a back room, if there are no records kept, if you have no one to represent you, if there are no other witnesses present, how in the world can a court deal with something like that? They can't. Then there is the whole question of dissociation. We've heard about that today. What is that? Well, years ago the Watchtower Society used to complain bitterly about the Catholic Church not excommunicating Adolf Hitler and a variety of other people. The Catholic answer to that is simple. simple. There are some people who are excommunicated laetae sententiae by the very fact that you commit a particular act you are excommunicated. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society has borrowed liberally from canon law of the Catholic Church and practices exactly the same thing under different rubrics. In other words, if you are baptized in another religion or if you should remarry when you're not considered to be free to do so or a variety of other things or if you put Christmas decorations on your house, or if you have a party for your six-year-old child <coughs> in the celebration of his birthday, you can be disfellowshipped or dissociated just like that. Well, is there scriptural basis for anything like this? One thing that some ex-witnesses fail to recognize is that any meaningful religious organization or secular organization must have rules and must insist that people abide by those rules to be members of those organizations. For instance, if you have a congregation of Christians and you have a man who comes into the congregation and he's a pedophile, you can't say, oh my goodness, uh, uh, we can't do anything about this fellow because the witnesses practice uh, disfellowshipment and, and the, uh, some of the Mennonites do and the Jews, they shun some of their people, the Orthodox Jews. So we can't be hard-hearted like that and we've got to be loving and uh, forgiving. I think that there's a, what I call a, a feather-headed approach on the part of certain evangelicals and they'll say, when you've been terribly hurt by somebody, oh, you've got to forgive. Personally, I think that the Bible teaches that forgiveness only follows repentance on the part of the person who has committed the sin. If you can't do anything about it, leave it with God. But that doesn't mean that you uh, go and say, oh, you're forgiven, when the person is an outright malefactor. And you don't want to let a pedophile loose in a congregation, do you? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, when people violate the rules of a group, 
in a, an immoral way, something needs to be done about that person. And, and the scriptures teach this, and very clearly teach it. And they do at, uh, I believe it's the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians. Many of you are familiar with this. And it's dealing really with uh, immoral persons. If you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 5 verses 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral men, not at all meaning the immoral of this world or the greedy and robbers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world, but rather I wrote you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunker, or robber, not even to eat with such a one. Now there's no doubt about this. And there are other passages, such as the one in Titus that deals with uh, the creation of a sect. But the one that the Watchtower likes to use, of course, is in one of the... Uh, uh, epistles of, of John and uh, what it uh, what it, it says specifically is is this in 2nd John uh, beginning really at uh, verse 8 look to yourself that you may not lose what you have worked for but may win a full reward Anyone who goes ahead and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into the house or give him any greeting. For he who greets him shares in his wicked work. Now, who is this talking about? Is this talking about someone who has left the witnesses and gone into the Methodist Church, uh, become an Anglican, joined a Bible student group? Is it talking about people like that? Well, if you go back a few verses, uh, about verse 6, and this is love, that we follow His commandments. This is the commandment, as you have heard from the beginning, that you follow love. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, men who will not acknowledge the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the anti antichrist. What's this talking about? Well, as a church historian, I'm very familiar with what it's talking about. In the period of the early church, from the second century on, there were a great many sects that are generally known as Gnostic sects, Gnosticism. Most of these sects, influenced by heathen ideas, believed that anything that was material was evil. The flesh was evil. Many of them refused to eat meat. Many of them refused to have sexual intercourse because they wanted to escape the flesh. So, what many of them said was this. Jesus Christ really couldn't have been fleshly. Jesus Christ came as a spirit or a phantom and simply appeared as a materialized person. And one sect even went so far as to say that when Jesus was taken to be crucified, he exchanged positions with Simon uh, of Cyrene and stood by laughing while they crucified Simon. Now these were the Gnostic groups, you see, and they said specifically that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. Now this was a terrible heresy. It was denying the manhood of Jesus Christ. Those were the persons that they weren't even to greet or speak to. How many people among ex-Jehovah's Witnesses teach such a doctrine or say that Jesus Christ didn't come in the flesh? It's utter nonsense. They have twisted the scriptures in the worst way imaginable. 
I know of so many cases, terrible cases, friends. You've heard some of them here, the effects of disfellowship. I've talked to several of the sisters here. It was a real privilege to hear their experiences on a first-hand basis. I wanted to cry. I want to tell you what it was like to have been an elder in some of those judicial hearings. I, I sat in judicial hearings where young couples would be brought in, charged with fornication. And some of the elders would turn to the young woman, sometime a girl of 15, 16, 17 years of age. Where did you lie when you had intercourse? How were you positioned? How far did he penetrate you? Can you imagine the psychological impact of middle-aged men getting their jollies, sitting there questioning a tender young girl, something like this? Disgusting is the only word for it. Disgusting. I've known men, too, to suffer terribly. When I was a graduate student at the University of Iowa in the States many years ago, there was a fellow in our congregation. His name was Rudy Hoover. Rudy and his wife loved one another, but Rudy's wife was not healthy. It was very painful for her to have marital relations with him. And he was a very virile man and felt that he needed a sexual relationship. The result was that he became involved with another woman, committed adultery. He begged to be reinstated. <coughs> he wanted help. He sought the elders. Complete coldness. Absolute coldness. One day I was sitting in a restaurant down in the center of the city, small city, about 30,000 people. We were right beside a tavern. I was there with some of the other students. We heard two shots, two pistol shots. We all got up and ran out in the street. Rudy had gone in, felt that this woman was destroying his hope for everlasting life, that she had seduced him, felt that he had no hope, he killed her, he killed himself. I know dozens of cases of attempted suicide. I know so many cases of parents being separated from their children. Children and <coughs> parents. Brother Ron Fry, a beautiful brother, hasn't seen his children, his one daughter, his granddaughter, or his great-granddaughter. The only time he's seen any member of his family for years is when his mother died, and she refused to see him before she died. People are cut off over and over again. We were fortunate. Our whole family came out. My aged uncle, my wife's mother, very intelligent woman, woman who had gone through University of Pittsburgh, Columbia University. She came out. Uh, my mother came out. My father was dead at the time. My niece, my nephew, my wife's brother and his wife, our two sons, our daughter, our daughters-in-law. Our older son and his wife uh, are now divorced although they're quite good friends and have a good relationship with regard to the children. The children are now grown. This girl was cut off completely by her family. She called my wife and said to Marilyn, you're a far more a mother to me than my own mother. Two sets of my grandchildren do not know their own grandparents. Disfellowshipping is the watchtower's weapon, and if this is broken, 
if they relent on this, or are forced to relent on this, the whole system will come tumbling down. People will start getting blood transfusions tomorrow. They'll start putting up Christmas trees. They'll have birthday parties. They'll be pretty much like everybody else. This is the weapon, the control weapon. The organization, however, is riding a bicycle. It knows that if it stops, it's going to fall off. And yet it's in a position now where it knows that it has to change. It's in very, very difficult position. It no longer has a date to look forward to. On top of that, it's losing great numbers of publishers. The internet is exposing its sins. And I want to tell you this, friends, and I'll talk about this more tomorrow. I believe that while we need to practice defensive court action, such as in custody cases and in uh, blood transfusion cases, I think it is a gross mistake to take the Watchtower Society to court in other areas. And I'll tell you why. I've been working on the history of the organization in Germany during the Third Reich. There is a real backlash among numerous civil libertarians and numerous scholars, many of them in Germany, some of them here in Britain, and quite a number in North America, who are frightened by the fact that if the religious freedom of Jehovah's Witnesses is taken away by the secular state, as is happening in France, who will be next? There is, all over the Western world, a real anti-religious movement. And personally, I do not want the secular state to be involved in attacking the Witnesses. It is extremely dangerous, it will bring a backlash against us, and it will also bring a backlash against many of the churches. I am very frightened by this, I am working with this. I therefore believe that what is far more effective is unremitting publicity of the Watchtower Society's sins. And I believe fully in the use of the internet, although I am very saddened by the fact that there are a number of atheistic and agnostic ex-witnesses on the internet who are doing everything in their power to attack Christianity and all religion. This bothers me greatly. I know some of these people and I'm very saddened. I must tell you, that although Canadian born and raised, I am a great admirer of one American principle, the principle stated in the First Amendment to the American Constitution. Congress may make no religion for the establishment of a religion or denying the free exercise thereof. We must allow witnesses to have legitimate freedom. We must be kind. We must be totally objective in our criticisms. Everything that we say needs to be proven. But we need to continue to attack unremittingly those things which are harmful, which are destructive, above all disfellowshipment and shunning, the historical course of the organization, what is done to women, what is done to children. We need to criticize the door-to-door -door sacrament of the Watchtower Society, and that's what it is, it's a sacrament. 
We need to criticize these things unremittingly, but we need to be extremely <coughs> fair and honorable in our doing so, not use any of their dirty tricks, and we need to be kind both to those who are coming out and those who are still in there. Yes. And we need to pray for those people. Mm -hmm. We need to ask our Heavenly Father to show them love. Mm -hmm. He showed it to us. Mm -hmm. He gave us amazing grace. Yes. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. And weren't we all? Yes. Sinners, weren't we all bound in darkness? Mm -hmm. And we needn't think now that we're so very brilliant that we've come out. <laughs> we're still very weak. We're still imperfect. We still make terrible mistakes. And it's taken me a long time to get certain watchtower characteristics out of me. You know that anger, mm -hmm. that willingness, that pugnacious willingness to fight? Mm -hmm. So I sometimes don't like me. I'm glad God does. Yes. And so in all of these things, let's be fair, let's be honorable, let's be loving. And when we get a chance, let's witness to the witnesses of the love of Christ. We, you know, I often say, you know, I don't object to the name Jehovah. I still like it. Because I never had that fear of Him. He was always my loving Heavenly Father. And now I have our Lord Jesus. I can pray directly to Him. I can say with Thomas, my Lord and my God. And, you know, I feel that love. That tremendous love. And He's there for all of you. He's there for all of us. And you know something, friends? We've got the biggest daddy on the block. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah.